nerve injury can be of uh, various severity and can occur due to a multitude of uh, causes now the causes can be suppose if there is a pull of uh, nerves then uh, they can be compression nerve injury where uh, the nerve can become compressed uh, like suppose you have slept in an odd position it can cause an injury to radial nerve can cause wrist drop then uh, sometimes in anesthetized people if uh, proper care is not taken then it can cause uh, compression of the ulnar nerve uh, common peroneal nerve uh, so the position has to be maintained in case of uh, anesthetized people then there can be cut injuries that can also cause nerve injuries apart from this a lot of diseases basically neuropathies in them also the changes occur as in nerve injuries so they can be multiple sclerosis they can be amyotrophic lateral sclerosis then leprosy so in all these diseases also we will get uh, the pathological changes same as we get in trauma injuries okay so now let's see that how the severity of nerve injuries is uh, classified and uh, what are the changes which can occur in case of nerve injury so for that first we should know a little bit about the structure of a nerve now remember that when we are talking of a nerve we are not talking of a single neuron nerve is basically a collection of a lot of neurons so here this is showing a cross section of a nerve and uh, you see that this outer black lining it is basically a connective tissue covering which is surrounding a lot of bundles of neurons so this outermost connective tissue covering is known as epineurium then inside you see that there are lot of bundles this blue color it is showing the bundles of lot of neurons so this is also a covering this covering is known as perineurium so the bundle of neurons which is surrounded by perineurium basically forms a fascicle then each neuron also you see it is surrounded by a connective tissue covering so to understand it we'll just try to pull out a fascicle and uh, this is one single neuron which has been pulled out and it's a myelinated neuron this is the myelin sheath so this uh, gray colored it is also a connective tissue covering surrounding the myelinated neuron in this case and uh, this covering is known as endoneurium so outermost covering the up covering is epineurium the innermost in covering is the endoneurium and the one which is surrounding a number of uh, nerve fibers that is the perineurium which forms a fascicle so the severity of a nerve injury is classified depending on how much of this structure is affected basically there are two classifications of uh, nerve injury one is the sedans classification a simpler classification which says that the first level of uh, nerve injury is neuropraxia in neuropraxia what happens that the entire nerve structure is intact and it is only a functional loss which is occurring basically in this case there is demyelination of the neuron and this will affect the conduction of the nerve impulse but you see anatomically the structure everything will be intact second level of uh, nerve injury severity is exonotomesis in exonotomesis there is injury to the nerve fiber however all the connective tissue sheaths that is the endoneurium the perineurium and the epineurium all are intact but there is some discontinuity in the exon right so discontinuity in the exon but overall all the connective tissue sheaths intact is known as exonotomesis third level is neurotomesis neurotomesis is when the connective tissue sheaths are also disrupted along with the discontinuity of the exon so in neurotomesis there can be discontinuity of endoneurium only and the perineurium and epineurium may be intact there may be discontinuity of endoneurium plus perineurium and uh, third one they can be that all the three that is endoneurium perineurium and epineurium all are disrupted so that is the sedans classification neuropraxia basically functional loss then exonotomesis then third is neurotomesis now in this you see in neurotomesis actually the detail that uh, which connective tissue sheath is injured is not mentioned 
Why this is important? Because ultimately it affects whether the regeneration of the neuron will take place or not. So to elaborate that, there is another classification which came little later than Sedon's classification that is known as Sunderland's classification. In this classification, there are five degrees. And first degree is basically same as that of the neuropraxia. That is, there will be functional loss. Then second degree is same as exonotomesis that is there, there will be exonal discontinuity with all the sheaths intact. Now third is where there is exonotomesis plus there is injury to the endoneurium as well. In the fourth there is endoneurium plus a perineurium injury while in the final one all the sheaths that is endoneurium, perineurium and epineurium everything is disrupted. Basically, classically you see, Sedon's classification talks about disruption of the connective tissue sheath, mainly the outer one that is the epineurium, it does not detail. So, here these third and fourth degrees do not have a counterpart in Sedon's classification, that is all. So, it is a more detailed classification. Okay. So, now what? So, there will be certain changes which occur in the neuron after the injury. So, what are these changes? Basically, Whenever an injury occurs, there is influx of calcium in the neuron and this leads to activation of certain enzymes that is a calcium dependent proteases and calcium dependent lipases. So, owing to this, a number of events start happening in the neuron. So, first is that as soon as there is injury, there is functional loss that is the transmission of the nerve impulse will be affected. That is the first immediate uh, thing which you will see and later on this will be followed by the physical degeneration. So suppose uh, this is the site of injury where uh, this part is showing the cell body of the neuron and uh, this part is the axon. So if this is the site of the injury, you see the neuron has been cut into two fragments. There is axonal discontinuity. So, if this is the site of injury, basically the neuron has been divided into a distal segment to the injury and a proximal segment to the injury. So, there will be two types of changes, changes which are distal to injury and changes which occur proximal to injury. Now, the changes which occur distal to injury were described by August Waller in 1850 and uh, that is why it is known as Wallerian degeneration. Also, uh, because it is uh, distal, it is also known as orthograde degeneration. So, what are these changes which occurring in the part of the neuron that is distal to the injury? So, first is there is cytoskeletal network degeneration. See, within the neuron, there are a lot of cytoskeletal elements. They are basically acting as tracks for carrying the material from the cell body to the uh, axon terminal. So, there is cytoskeletal network degeneration plus this myelin and the cell membrane also disintegrate, they break down. So, something like this. Then what happens? You know that this uh, myelin is basically formed by the Schwann cell membrane, isn't it? So, Schwann cell release certain chemoattractants which cause recruitment of uh, phagocytic cells. So, lot of phagocytic cells that is macrophages come and invade the area of the injury in the distal segment. So, this green color is showing the macrophages and uh, you know that macrophages are basically the debris cleaner. So, they will start eating all the debris which is uh, generated due to the disintegration of uh, myelin, the breakdown of the membrane and the cytoskeletal network. Yeah, by the way, these calcium dependent lipases which I told, they, call, they are the ones which cause the membrane breakdown and myelin degeneration. Okay. So, yeah, we were talking about the recruitment of the phagocytic cells and the cleaning of the debris by these cells. Now, once these macrophages come to the site, they obviously clear the debris, but along with that, they release a cytokine that is interleukin 1 which causes Schwann cell proliferation. So, here in the distal segment the proliferation of the Schwann cell will start which is known as gliosis. So, see Schwann cell are the ones which release chemoattractant to cause the recruitment of phagocytic cells and phagocytic cells now are acting on the Schwann cell causing their proliferation. So, finally what happens basically you see the distal segment has degenerated, the membrane is not there, the debris has been cleaned, myelin has degenerated, 
but the Schwann cells are proliferated. So in the distal segment, we get a something known as distal stump or a Schwann cell columns. So these Schwann cell columns act like tracks. It's like a road path which is provided such that if this portion wants to grow, it can grow inside this already laid path by the Schwann cells. Okay. So what is the timeline of these changes? I told you that functional loss is immediate. Then uh, this uh, cytoskeletal degeneration, myelin and membrane uh, loss occurs over a period of uh, two to three days. Then there is a recruitment of the phagocytic cells. And this Schwann cell proliferation or the formation of the columns, it uh, takes around one week. Now, what are the changes which occur proximal to the injury? That is the this segment. See, in the cell body, that is the soma, chromatolysis starts. Chromatolysis uh, basically is a condition in which this cell body swells and the nucleus moves to a eccentric position. It uh, basically corners itself. And rough endoplasmic reticulum, there is some breakdown. Plus, there is also degeneration here. So, the first node of Ranvier near to the injury. Till there, there is a degeneration in the axon as well. So, these are the changes which occur proximal to injury. Okay. But along with this, the degeneration happening in the distal segment and the changes occurring in the proximal segment, what happens that along with this, some changes occur which promote regeneration and these changes are basically change in pattern of genes which are expressed. Plus, there is increase in the protein and RNA synthesis uh, in the proximal segment and the Schwann cells. They secrete nerve growth factor. So, these are the regenerative changes occurring. Because of this, what happens? This part of the exon starts giving regenerative sprouts. So, a lot of uh, sprouts start uh, coming from this segment of the neuron. Now, this it can go here, here, here. So, multiple ways these uh, sprouts can grow. But it is the Schwann cells which actually guide these sprouts to the track. So there are certain chemicals released from the Schwann cells which act on these nerve terminals causing the nerve terminals along the path to grow. Now one thing you remember is that these regenerative changes occur very well in a peripheral nervous system. But regeneration of the neuron does not occur in central nervous system. This is because in peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells are there which release certain uh, growth factors and they guide the sprouts towards the path. But in central nervous system, it is other way around. The oligodendrocytes which are surrounding the neuron, they actually inhibit the regeneration. They secrete certain inhibitory factors such that these sprouts do not uh, form and they do not grow any further. Is it good or bad? Well, it appears bad, but one thing you should remember that central nervous system and all the neurons are packed, isn't it? So, you cannot allow any chance of misguidance. So, suppose if axonal sprouts grow and they grow some in wrong direction, what will happen? There is no space there, isn't it? So, they, it may go and make contact with other connections and it will create a havoc in central nervous system. So, physiologically, it might be good. But when we see this in patients, it, very, it is very heartbreaking since the neurons in central nervous system cannot regenerate. Anyways, there is a lot of research going on and uh, how to promote this uh, regenerative changes in central nervous system. Okay, let's come back to our topic. Uh, we were talking about the axonal sprouts. So now, once these axonal sprouts grow, there can be two outcomes. One, that they grow back to the original target along the laid path. Or second, these axons become entangled. So here all the sprouts will get entangled to each other and they will not grow any further. Now this depends how severe the injury is which we discussed in the beginning. So actually this uh, neuropraxia which we said that there is no axonal discontinuity that is the grade 1. This has a very good prognosis, no need to grow back and nothing that kind of things are not happening. So, it's a, it has a very good prognosis. Exonotemesis, also it has a good prognosis because the connective tissue sheets are not injured, the paths are laid down. So, there are very less chances 
because the sheets are intact isn't it so there are very less chances that they will grow in different different directions on the other hand neurotemesis if the outer covering is injured or even for that matter these coverings if they are injured in that case it becomes little difficult for regeneration so in this case basically surgery helps where you suture the various connective tissue sheets together and uh, the guidance will be done by our physiological processes by our schwann cells themselves okay so that was about the prognosis that how you tell about the prognosis of the nerve injury but there are certain consequences which happen one is that if the neuron doesn't regenerate what happens the area which it is supplying okay uh, like suppose here i am showing a neuromuscular junction so what happens this is a target organ it has a receptors for the uh, neurotransmitter which will be released now when there is degeneration these receptors increase in number we call it up regulation so there is up regulation of the receptors such that even minute release of the neurotransmitters now will excite the target organ more so that is known as denervation hypersensitivity it is a common phenomena in body whenever the concentration of the chemical goes up the receptors go down on the other hand when the chemical goes down the receptor goes up so it is a regulatory mechanism in body which in this case becomes pathological causes denervation hypersensitivity second consequence can be that there can be chain of events which can lead to nerve degeneration so suppose this is the neuron which is injured what will happen that the signal will not go to next neuron if the signal doesn't go to next neuron this neuron will also degenerate because there are certain trophic factors also so this neuron will also degenerate so that is known as anterograde neuronal degeneration then the neurons which are making connections here on the cell body of the injured neuron they also get removed and what happens that this area gets occupied by glial cells so this is known as synaptic stripping so this is a phenomena uh, which can occur and uh, what happens that if there is a injury in one part of the brain suppose it can lead to loss of function due to some neurons in other part of the brain because the neurons may be interconnected and they all will undergo degeneration due to the chain of events which is occurring so yeah so that can also occur anterograde neuronal degeneration and retrograde neuronal degeneration fine finally there can be wrong connection so even if the growth is occurring there can be formation of wrong connection so uh, you might have heard about crocodile tear syndrome in this what happens uh, this is a phenomena which occurs in patients of bell's palsy where there is a palsy of uh, seventh cranial nerve so during regeneration there can be cross connections with other nerves so what happens that there is lacrimation that is the tears which uh, fall while eating so because they are false tears the person is not actually crying but uh, while eating there is a stimulation of the nerve and uh, it causes the tears to come out so that is known as crocodile tear syndrome then there can be formation of neuroma that is the entangled mass of the uh, neuron so as i told you that there is formation of the sprouts if it doesn't grow into the path laid down by the schwann cells the schwann cell column then it gets entangled and it is very painful in case of sensory fibers well that is all about the nerve injury the classification the changes which can occur the consequences and what is the prognosis of different types of nerve injury well thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open thank you